Hi everybody, my name is Mallory. I am coming to you with my first video, I guess first and only video, um, where I'm going to be talking about my year-long journey of sobriety from PMO. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with what PMO is, it, it stands for Porn Masturbation Orgasm. Uh, last year, I had... This is... I already know I'm going to cry. I've already cried a few times in the last week, <laughs> knowing that I was getting to this point. I'll be at a year on Tuesday, and I'm not really going to have the time to um, film this next week, so I'm just going to do it now. Um... I also apologize if you hear my cat's over here. He's just like doing his thing, so don't mind him. Um, yeah, a year ago, I realized that um, I needed help. I kind of already like knew that I needed help, but it was not, it wasn't apparent to me like how I was going to do that. Um, I would say over like the past, if you don't know this about me already, I've talked about it plenty of times on my blog here. Um, not many people like family members or anything like that, close friends of mine known, but um, I did really struggle with a porn addiction, masturbation, a sex addiction, all of those things of sexual immorality combined into one big horrible graveyard, <laughs> horrible like hole in the ground that was really hard to get out of. And I, I, don't, I can't even tell you how long I suffered with that. I can't tell you how, when it started or anything like that, but I want to say maybe before freshman year of high school. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was a lot. And I don't even know, like, where to start with this video. So... I was reading a book last year called Finally Free by Heath Lambert and one of, it was all about practical ways to break your porn addiction and, or your sexual addictions really. Like that's really the overall arching addiction. It's a sexual addiction. It's not like drugs or alcohol. It's porn um, and, and other things. Uh, and a part of this book, I'm a very practical thinker. I'm a very logical person. I need to have tasks and I need to set boundaries for myself and set goals in order to achieve an overall goal. So this book set it out just like that. He had a list of things saying like, this is what you need to do to start the progress of freedom. And it focused a lot around scripture and it was just, it was super fruitful for me, but it was about taking the step then, about doing it, and part of it was finding an accountability partner. I had never even heard of the word accountability partner. I had no idea what that entailed, but it meant that I had to be vulnerable with somebody. And anyone who knows me well knows that I've always been a blunt person. I've always never, I've never neglected to express how I feel about something. And it's been all harmful in some areas, but also good and fruitful in others. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who has known me since I was like 11 and I asked her if she would my, be my accountability partner a year ago um, next Tuesday, so July 24th. And I was so nervous because she had no idea. She's known me for all these years. She had no idea I was struggling with that kind of thing. And I thought, why not? And at first I was on my way there and I'm like, if this is actually what I'm going to do, this is going to change the course of like my relationship with her if things don't end the way I want them to because I'm about to be vulnerable with her about a struggle I've been experiencing. Um, so I did. And she was so excited. <laughs> she was so excited. I already feel emotional. She was so excited to help me. And on top of getting an accountability, accountability partner, I um, finally was able to get into therapy. Um, I tried so many different ways to get therapy. I tried so many different things. Um, it, it was either like my insurance didn't cover it or, and I'm talking about over the last couple of years of like struggling with this and not being open about it. People not knowing there was nothing that would work where like I could afford it or insurance wouldn't cover it or 
nothing fell into place. And I just took that as a sign that like it wasn't time or that I was going to be chained to this forever. And um, it just fell into my lap, the therapist that did for an affordable price, someone who loved the Lord, someone who works in law enforcement, someone who understands my logical thinking. And it was the biggest blessing from God ever. And I met with her yesterday for the last time and we have been meeting for 11 months. So it wasn't shortly after I met my met up with my accountability partner, started that whole process that I met with, started meeting with my therapist. So I just want to discuss something first. So I want to get this out of the way for people who don't understand addiction and don't understand how addicts work and how they're brain works. I can only speak from my experience of being an addict that it's still not easy. I'm, I'm sure I'll say that again in this video. It's not easy. It's still not easy, but especially when I started, it was not easy. Um, even still when things get hard and when I don't feel good about myself, like this past week when I don't feel good about myself, if I were to tell you that the first thought I have is to, and pardon my language, it's going to be vulgar, you guys, but if my first thought wasn't to go masturbate, because that's how I identify with value, that's how I have in the past year, I'd be lying. Because as an addict, when things get hard, it's not easy to logically just be like, Oh, I'm just going to go hang out with someone and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work that way. You know, that my, my brain isn't wired that way. And unfortunately, it, it's still sometimes pretty, like, sex-driven. And that's because I'm still in the thick of it. And I'm not in a, a mental space where everything is going to be pure and dandy. And that's okay, and I've accepted that because I don't identify. I don't think that that's like my identifying factors. I think that's just like a hiccup in the road um, of this journey, and I think it's going to get better, and I've been super, super good about controlling it. So I just wanted to get that out of the way that like addicts, it's not just like logical for us to stop thinking a certain way or get over it. When things get hard, when I feel bad about myself, when something hard happens, like I've been on a discovery of triggers, which has been a really hard thing to figure out when it's so subconscious to you as an addict. Um, when I figure out my triggers and I don't feel value, something so minor happens where I just feel like I don't have control over the situation. The first thing I want to do is run to my computer. The first thing I want to do, I have been able to exercise my brain muscles and my body to say no. And that is something the first couple of months that I thought I was never going to get past. And I'm not saying it's been like a cakewalk. <sighs> this whole entire year, I've experienced three relapses. And I can't even tell you how many times whenever I relapse, like my first thought is my accountability partner is going to be so disappointed in me. She's going to be so disappointed in me. And... A part of me is like, don't tell her. It's fine. It's just one time. And then the other part of me, the stronger part of me was like, just tell her, just get it over with. And I would go to a meetup with her. We were meeting like twice a month for a while, once a month, twice a month. And I would always tell her and she would just beyond meet my expectations. She was never judgmental. She was never critical. She always was forgiving and reminded me that God loved me. And it's just been such a blessing to have an accountability partner like that. I, I can't even begin to explain someone that has known me for so long and didn't criticize me for, for struggling with this kind of thing. It's just been such a blessing. And like I said, like, it's not been easy. I dread when I relapsed, I dreaded selling her. I dreaded it, but I did it anyway because I knew it was healthy to talk about it with somebody. <laughs> I never cried, but like the past week, oh my gosh, I've been like crying like a baby. 
Um, so yeah, my accountability partner's just been like phenomenal. And I, God was so vivid and so like blunt. Like he's just, I get that from him. I swear to God, I swear. He's so blunt about it and was just like, Mallory, this is it. This is where you're going to be now. This is who you're going to interact with. I put you guys together for a reason and this is where it's going to go. And like with therapy, those two together have been so eye-opening. I've realized so much about myself. But it's been so difficult. And if you were to tell me this time last year that I would be where I am... I would have laughed at you because when you build a foundation on top of like sex and like that that's for me anyway I don't know about other sex addicts but that's where I had value that's how I identified value and that's really messed up for my future well would be now I'm in a much healthier spot but like that's how I identified myself as a female, as a future wife, as a Christian, someone who really wanted to pursue or have someone pursue me that had the same faith. That is something that really messed with me. And I had to, honestly, it felt like I was rewiring my brain from the get-go. Um, and I, I never asked for help. Y'all, I never ask for help. I'm a control freak. I always feel like I have control over it. Like, in a good way, too, but... Um... This just took all the control from me. And... If you're not a believer, you don't believe in God, that's fine. All good and dandy, but I'm telling you what, man. The control was, like, ripped from under my feet. And... It was so difficult. I can't even tell you how many times I had therapy sessions where I just sobbed because I could feel the control leaving. And I think the biggest struggle for me, like in the past year has been one realizing and accepting that I don't have control. It's so easy for us to think we have control and then we think it's going to be easier if we control it, but it's actually the other way around. It's easier for us not to control it and let God do his thing with it. It's just sometimes hard for us to understand like patience. Um, for me anyway. Oh, my mascara is not like everywhere. <laughs> um, and then on top of that with the whole, and this is something I've just been realizing the last couple weeks is I made PMO and sex my savior. That was my idol. We don't think that like idols are a thing anymore because they talk about it in like the Old Testament. Idols are real, people. Idols are real. And PMO and sex were my idols. And when I took those away as my idol, my next instinct and Satan's next trick is to put something else in that place and to say, this is a much healthier idol for you. So for me, it's it's been like relationships. Well, Mallory, you've been single for so long. You've been super good about being abstinent. You've really gotten a hold on your addiction. Now you have free time. You need to pursue a relationship. You need to get into a relationship because that's what's going to make you happy. And guess what? That's a lie. Nobody's going to fulfill me. Nobody's going to fulfill me except Christ. And I, that should be the most obvious thing you've ever heard, I've ever heard, but it's not. Um, it's a hard, I think sometimes in like our society, it's hard for us to like hear that and understand that. And something I've sort of been thinking about today, I was thinking about what I was going to say in this video and how I was going to be raw with everybody and not bawl my eyes out in the process was thinking to myself the last season you know before I graduated high school I was working full-time as in security I was volunteering at the BCA for like six seven months as an intern I was in night classes and then the only I was gone from sun up to sundown and I had a cat to take care of on top of that and when I graduated high school 
I have more free time, even now. I have a new job and I have so much more free time. And the last like months and over the past year, I've really recognized that like my weight and my mental, I'm so much better mentally. So it's hard to like explain this, but like my weight has struggled because I've been trying to deal with what's here rather than what's here because what here and what's here matter more to me than what is here. But now I'm coming to a realization where I'm seeing that I allowed the past year to like affect other areas of my life. And now that my seasons are open, I am alone. Uh, and by that, I mean, I can't use people to distract me from silence. I can't use people to distract me from, cause like when I was starting this sobriety journey, I was terrified to be alone cause triggers lied within silence. You know, I've gotten so much more comfortable with silence and that's all good and dandy, but I'm alone and that sucks. <laughs> I'm alone, but I'm not alone, right? Because I know and understand I can connect the puzzle pieces. I know God is with me always. And even when I think he's not there, he's there. And I'm sure he's like looking at me like, Mallory, come on. Did I ever let you down? Did I ever let you down? The answer is no. No. He's just always fulfilled his promises at his own timing, not mine. So, yeah, I mean... To recap, a year has been crazy. I can't believe I'm at a year. I still, and like I said, like, I'm not completely, like, free of it. I'm sure this is something I will struggle with for a long time. And I thought my faith with God was, like, in a good spot. I thought that I was really close with Christ and my faith, and boy, was I wrong until I diligently had to every day, like if I was at work and I started having an impure thought, I had to literally walk away and say a prayer. That took discipline and diligence. And that's, everyone's faith is gonna be up and down all the time. It's never gonna be perfect. And God never said that faith was going to be easy. And there are so many people in the world who struggle with this kind of stuff. And if you're watching this and you know me, thank you. Like, thank you for listening to my story. And they, I, and I hope that like maybe people watching this identify with this. I know I write a lot on this blog about this kind of stuff and sort of how I feel. And I'm not so amazing at writing. I enjoy writing, but I'm just like not very good at words. I'd rather just say it in person. Um, thank you. Like, thank you for taking the time and listening to me talk and watching me cry. It's been really fun. <laughs> um, just know that like, even though I've made it a year, like I said, it doesn't mean that I'm like in the clear, I'm still going to struggle. And unfortunately, just because I've replaced that idol of addiction does not mean that other things aren't going to creep into the place, into the next place. You know, I need to be diligent about like where Christ fits into that and how I can put him in that box. Yeah. I'm kind of talking out my ass right now, but sorry, mom, if you're watch watching this, excuse my French. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Leave a comment, message me. Oh, excuse me. Hiccup. Message me if you have any questions. I love Anons. And thank you, I guess, to like my accountability partner, if you're watching this, thank you. I would not have been able to do it without you. I wouldn't have. Thank you to my therapist for being cool. <laughs> and for not like criticizing me. To my parents for allowing me to be open and honest about my struggles. And that I'm trying to get better. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Bye, guys.